Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer and I have with me today Rena Van Oust from Strata Central. Hi, Rena. Hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm doing well, gearing up for Christmas. Uh, are you taking a break, Rena? Yes, definitely. Even though I've been on a recent holiday, um, our office is going to close for about two and a half weeks. So we always look forward to that summer break. Excellent. Yes, we close for about three weeks. I do like to see professionals in this sector taking a break, closing down. It's a quiet time of the year for us, say for any uh, plumbing, electrical <laughs> emergencies <laughs> that strata managers may have, but important to have a break after a busy year full of wins and challenges. And that is, of course, what we're here today to talk about. Let's kick off with your challenge for this week, Rena. Well, this is, I think I keep prefacing all my um, challenges with interest, Amanda, but this is probably a fairly common issue that occurs in buildings where people like to smoke either in their courtyard or on the balcony. And in a particular scheme, a tenant has just moved in onto the top floor of a, I think it's a five-story building, and they're complaining that there is smoking from the courtyard. And at first I said, well, can you identify which courtyard it is, which bottom floor apartment, because obviously you need to um, make sure that you write to the correct person if they are smoking. So she gave me an apartment number and then I wrote to that person who I know who's one on the strata committee and she said, well, I don't smoke. So I went back to her and, and said to her, well, I have gone to the person that you identified as the person that's smoking and they've advised me that they don't smoke. So then she must have taken some time and given me another apartment number. So before I made the same mistake again by contacting that person, I went back to the strata committee and just said, do any of you know if this person smokes? And they said, yes, this person has lived in the building 15 years and has been smoking in their courtyard. Anyway, so I said, okay, I said to the strata committee, we need to write to that person. And they said to me, well, first of all, like there's no bylaw that says people can't smoke. And I said, yes, there is now as Strata managers would be aware of in the new model bylaws. There are new no smoking bylaws, which would have to be adopted if they were to be enforced. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that they said was that the woman's actually um, that's complaining. It's on the other side of the building, so there's no mm -hmm. way that smoke would be going sort of over the roof and over on the onto the other side. Anyway, so this woman, I actually wrote to her and said, this is what we've been advised, that the smoke now, it's highly unlikely it's coming from that particular apartment. It could be coming from the neighbouring development. And then she, Amanda, produces a doctor's certificate to say that, you know, I think she's trying to get out of her lease as well. So I think mm -hmm. she's just trying to use any excuse. So when I was doing some research for a recent webinar that I did on the REI Strata Chapter Committee, I was looking at bylaws and I found that even if you don't have the no smoking bylaw, there is a new section 153 in the Act which says owners, occupiers or other persons not to create nuisance. So it talks about no one affecting another person or their use of common property, that you can't affect someone's use or enjoyment of a lot or permit the lot to be used or enjoyed in a manner or for a purpose that causes a nuisance or hazard to the occupier of any other lot. Mm -hmm. Down the bottom in that section, it says, note, depending on the circumstances in which it occurs, the penetration of smoke from smoking into a lot or common property may cause a nuisance or hazard and may interfere unreasonably with the use or enjoyment of the common property or another lot. So, in your experience, Amanda, have you come across this section 153 and have you had to use it? Or And in our circumstance where this person is complaining about smoke, which is not coming from our property, but it's coming from another property, have you sort of had any experience with someone trying to, you know, use a vehicle like smoking in a sense to be able to, you know, say, well, I'm being affected by someone in the building? Mm, yes, definitely. And this is becoming more and more common. We are seeing some cases come through our tribunal now that are directly on this point. The most recent one, we did mention it, I think, back in episode 182, the GISKS case, G-I-S-K-S. -S. 
This was a tribunal case from the New South Wales Tribunal and the tribunal referred directly to Section 153, the nuisance provision, Mm -hmm. and said that smoke drift coming from one lot onto a neighbouring lot is indeed a nuisance because it is interfering with that other person's use and enjoyment of their lot. So that's a very recent case. I think it was about September coming out of our tribunal. This was a building that did not have a no smoking bylaw or a bylaw that dealt with the issue, but the lot owner was the applicant in that case and actually brought proceedings against the owner's corporation requiring them to do something about the nuisance. So Amanda, in this case where we're talking about someone who's trying to allege that the smoke is coming from another lot, even though it is highly unlikely that it is affecting her because it's on the other side of the building. How should the Ernest Corporation deal with that type of scenario? Well, in order to establish the nuisance, she does need to show that it is the smoke from that lot that she's complaining about that is affecting her peaceful enjoyment. It sounds like she may have some trouble doing that if she is indeed on the other side of the building. Mm. The Ernest Corporation doesn't have to make an application against the owner that's being complained about, doesn't have to, even if it did have a bylaw, enforce the bylaw against the owner. If the owner's corporation feels that there's not enough evidence, there isn't a nuisance of the type complained about, then it's within the discretion of the strata committee, of course, acting at all times in good faith and in the best interests of the building as a whole, to decide that it's not going to do anything. And that doesn't stop this owner who is apparently being affected from commencing her own proceedings in the tribunal. And that's not unusual in smoking cases that we see it's one lot owner bringing an application against another lot owner and the owner's corporation stepping aside and saying, look, we'll be bound by whatever orders the tribunal makes so far as they affect us, but we don't don't have a dog in this fight, if you like. So, but in this scenario, the person who's complaining is a tenant. So could that tenant still make their own application? Would that be against the owner's corporation? Because she's trying to sort of, I think, involve the owner's corporation. She's actually even directly writing to me. And I, I sort of, the agents are still being copied in, but I'm trying to sort of distance myself mm. from direct communication with her. But as a tenant, what rights would she have in terms of taking any action? Because I think she's trying to perhaps get out of her lease. Yeah, she has the same rights as an owner to commence proceedings in the tribunal. The Strata Schemes Management Act says that interested persons can commence proceedings and the definition of interested persons includes tenants, residents in lots. It is not just limited to owners. The issue about the lease is very interesting because we have had a case in New South Wales where a landlord has been fined by the Tenancy Tribunal, separate from our strata division, Mm. by the Tenancy Tribunal for failing to provide a healthy living environment for their tenant because that tenant was suffering smoke drift from a neighbouring lot in a strata scheme. And that is the case of Bandari and Laming. I won't spell that out for you, but I'll put a link to the case in the show notes for the episode. It's a 2015 tribunal case. And that landlord was fined $11,000 for failing to do anything about a chain smoking neighbor. Mm. This is quite interesting, Amanda, because she's bringing the owner's corporation into it Mm. rather than the lot owner. That's what I'm sort of, I know, know that tenants do have rights, but would her application be against the Yannis Corporation, her landlord, or the other person that's actually smoking, who's also a tenant apparently as well. So I think it's making it really complicated. No, well, not really. In my view, she could list all of those parties as respondents to her application. The owner's corporation, the allegedly smoking neighbour and her landlord. The difficulty with the landlord is that it's probably an action that should be heard in a different division Mm. of the tribunal. So there's some procedural issues there. But that would be quite common that you would see the owner's corporation drawn into an application that also involves another lot owner. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Amanda. It's quite complex when there's so many different parties that could be involved in this scenario. Yeah. And it might be that the owner's corporation makes clear that they have considered the issue very carefully, they have investigated the complaint and they have decided that they're not going to take any action at this point in time. I think if that's the decision, it's important to communicate that to the tenant and perhaps even say it's a matter for you to seek your own advice 
if you wanted to take the matter further. And if she did go and do that, she might find that she could make an application to the tribunal involving the other owner, may or may not involve the owner's corporation and may or may not make an application that's relevant to her lease and her rights under her lease. But, um, yeah, there are a few avenues there for her and we are definitely seeing more cases come out of our tribunal where it is found that smoking is indeed a nuisance under Section 153 of our Act. So thank you for that one. It's always good to refresh on those regular issues that we know our committee members, our strata managers and residents are facing. The challenge that I am going to jump into today is one of terminology. And Rena, we have spoken about this particular challenge off air. It's one that we were talking through together. It relates to an owner's corporation's right to waive interest on overdue levies. And you and I were talking about a building where a lot owner had requested a payment plan and the committee had asked how does that work when it comes to interest? If we decided that we didn't want to charge interest, for example, for a short period of time, six months or so, to give this owner a bit of a break, how do we go about doing that? And you and I had a look at Section 85 in our Mm. 2015 Act in New South Wales and we read Subsection 3, which says, an owner's corporation may, by resolution, determine either generally or in a particular case, that a contribution is to bear no interest. And we asked each other, what does by resolution mean? Does it mean the owners' corporation has to have a general meeting and pass a resolution? Does it mean the strata committee can pass that resolution? Because we have another section in our Act that says that a decision of the strata committee is a decision of the owners' corporation. Now, I took the view that the Strata Committee could make that decision because the section did not specify that the resolution had to be a resolution at a general meeting. And I took some guidance from the balance of Section 85, which has different wording. If you look at subsection 4, it talks about an owner's corporation by resolution at a general meeting, it says Mm. those words, determining that a person may pay 10% less of a contribution if they pay before the due date. So in other parts of Section 85, the terminology by resolution at a general meeting is used, but in subsection 3, when we're talking about waiving interest on contributions, the wording simply says by resolution, not by resolution at a general meeting. So I came to the conclusion that the Strata Committee could make that resolution. Rena, I know you had some experience with the previous 1996 Mm. version of the Act. Yeah, so previously, Amanda, the legislation mentioned that could only be done by special resolution and general meeting to actually waive interest. So Mm. when you look at that section, I think that they really made a mistake because or maybe perhaps they didn't mean to. Um, If you're giving 10% off or letting someone not pay 10% more, it seems to me that there's sort of different sides of the same coin. Mm. And I think perhaps it might have been an omission or I mean, not an omission, but a perhaps a drafting error, we call yeah, it. A drafting <laughs> error. But also too, I think it is a good idea to give the strata committee that, that flexibility because sometimes there are cases where people are suffering hardship and um, they may not want everyone to know that, you know, all the owners to know that they're suffering hardship. So allowing the strata community to have that discretion, I think is a good idea. And if, even if it was a drafting error. So yeah. yes, I think it's an important one. I think for a lot of us who are used to the old act, just mm. assuming quickly that it does mean general meeting resolution. But when you look at the terminology, it is quite clear that the wording by general meeting is used in that section as opposed to by resolution for the interest waiving section. And it might be perhaps a recognition that people will be asking the strata committee after the levy has been struck after perhaps the notice has been issued and they've received it in their inbox and they've said, oh, okay, this is a large amount. I don't think I'm going to be able to pay this. I'm going to ask for some leniency when it comes to interest. And it might be Section 85 recognising that we shouldn't have to send all owners back to a general meeting. They've just come from a general meeting where the levy's been Mm. struck. Why does everybody have to go back to a general meeting to make that decision? It's different to a situation where you may be deciding as a community that people who pay before the due date 
should be given a reward and pay 10% less. And that's a decision that's made before the levy is struck and before the notice is issued because, of course, logically yes. you're giving them the discount before the due date. That may be, if it's not a drafting error, it might be a very carefully considered intentional piece of drafting for that reason. So that's my view. Do contact me, as I know many of you do, if you don't agree or if you do agree, I'd love to hear from you too. Let me know your thoughts. Actually, one of the considerations that I was thinking about when the Strata Committee may give someone 10% interest saving if they're not paying on time, Amanda, is how does that affect the other people perhaps that may not have been able to pay their levies on time Mm. and have paid interest and usually reminder fees that have been sent by the Strata Managing Agent? In a sense, sometimes I think that if it's not documented, then other people perhaps don't know that that avenue is available to them. So sometimes I can see that some people perhaps can't afford it. Mm. We'll say, okay, well, I'll pay 10% because it's cheaper than putting it on my credit card. While other people would come and say, I can't pay the interest. So I, don't, I think there are issues of, I don't know how it would be best described, but it's not a publicised thing that people can come to the Strata Committee and ask for that interest to be waived. And I think mm. perhaps maybe by talking about it today, more owners who are in financial hardship. I think the other thing also is sometimes trying to not test the veracity of what people are saying, but there are people that perhaps may use it as a means to achieve a gain that they would rather have their money somewhere else rather than paying it off and paying interest. So Mm. I suppose it's one of those difficult things where you do have to assess it on a case-by-case basis and look at the history of their payment because if some people have been paying all the time on time and then they come across a time when they aren't able to, that's probably one consideration. But there are some people that we have that have come to us that have always been in arrears, never paid on time, you know, always pay it sort of before it gets referred to legal action. So I think it makes those decisions by the Strata Committee probably more um, important than just, you know, looking at the whole general interest charging component when people are suffering hardship. Yeah, it is a very difficult decision to make. And as a committee member myself, I have been involved in making those decisions. Of course, it is always open to the committee to say, hey, we're not going to make this decision on our own. We are actually going to convene a general meeting and ask the owners to decide what they would like to do and the majority carries the day. So that is always an option for a confused committee, a a committee that either feels that it can't make the decision, maybe you read the legislation differently to me, or it's a difficult decision and there are arguments on both sides take it to a general meeting and uh, you can't really be criticised for doing that. If the majority of owners present and voting at that general meeting say, no, we don't agree that interest should be waived, then that's the decision that the majority have made. Yeah, that sounds good, Amanda. Okay, let's head over to your win for this week, Rena. Yeah, so I actually had a scheme approach me where their strata managing agent had resigned and they had no strata manager and obviously they were approaching me for a proposal And there was a bit of angst between the owners for various reasons, which is probably not an uncommon thing in in Strata. But so one, you know, a couple of people wanted one manager put forward, another few owners want another manager put forward. And the problem was is that the Strata manager had resigned. And I want to bring to the attention of of our listeners, obviously it's Section 50 that that we have referred to, Amanda. So previously um, Strata managing agent contracts would come to an end at the end of their term but then keep rolling on for a month-to-month period until they were terminated or a new agreement was entered into. But what's happened now with the legislation, there's quite a number of steps that we have discussed previously under Section 50 where as you come three months before the term ends, the agent must give notice. They can extend it by three months of successive terms up to the next AGM, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in this case, I'm not really aware of why their agent resigned. I think now I know why, but (laughs) at the end of it, they did decide to appoint our company, which was a good outcome. But I think for our listeners, I think people need to remember this whole thing of the section 50, where is their agent giving them three months notice before the term expires? Because what's happening is that I don't believe this was a case in this particular instance, Amanda. And now they've got, it's been, I think a month now, they've got bills to pay that haven't been paid you know, they obviously need someone to help them draft an agenda and comply with, with the timetable because the first time they sent an agenda it wasn't in the right timetable. So I had to say no, you know, the seven clear days, what that means now. So because the other owner didn't, you know, said, well, you haven't given us sufficient time. You sent the agenda on this date. The meeting is on this date. This doesn't comply with the act, which I said, that's correct. 
yeah, so there are a lot of legal areas that I think are affecting owners where there are owners that aren't happy with their agent or vice versa. But I think the section probably has caused a, a few problems because in a sense, who's going to go to the tribunal and say, well, you know, the agent that we're not happy with didn't give us three months notice that it was going to terminate. Yeah, yeah. You can see the intent behind that requirement. It's in section 50, subsection 6, that a strata managing agent must give the owner's corporation written notice of the end of a term of appointment at least three months before the end of the term. You can see how that period has been carefully set to allow the committee to get other quotes if they'd like from strata managing agents, ask their current strata manager to forward their proposed new agreement to think about what they're going to do at the end of that term. But I have to say, Rena, I agree with you. I think this is being overlooked. I don't think I've ever seen one of these notices. And I do attend a number of general meetings for lot owner clients where strata managers are being reappointed, new strata managing agents are being proposed, and it does often come as a surprise to the owners in the room. Oh, the agreement is up. Oh, Mm. if I had known that, I would have gone and got some other quotes. We would have had a tender process. Strata committee, why didn't you do that? And the strata committee says, oh, well, it sort of crept up on us. And to me, that means that the strata manager is not complying with this requirement of Section 50. Well, we're finding finding that out quite a lot, Amanda, for other agents that we're taking um, schemes from. But the other thing that I think perhaps maybe I've looked also is that subsection six also says, yeah, at least three months before the end of the term of appointment and at least one month before the end of each extension of a term permitted. So even when you've got the three months, you've still got to then one month before the three month expires, you've Mm. still got to then let them know and um yeah so what we're talking about there is the right of the strata committee to resolve to extend the term for three month periods up to the next agm only up to the next agm that's right Mm. just to give you some extra time to convene that agm and perhaps to get other quotes if that's what you want to do but yes very good point the managing agent still has to give that notice one month before the expiry of an extension term Mm. Mm. Well, always good to hear what's going on on the ground there and how our uh, legislation is being applied. It's been a few years now, three years, three years now. Yeah. Happy anniversary uh, of our 2015 (laughs) Act and uh, still getting used to it, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, I am bringing a case to the table for my win this week and as I often do talk about cases in the category of wins, it is not necessarily because I agree with the outcome or I support the uh, reasoning in the case, it is because I think the more cases we have looking at our legislation and applying it to real life situations, the more helpful it is. So this case is particularly interesting because it is a court of appeal case and it relates to defamation. Mm. Now, you may remember way back in episode 167, Rena and I spoke about the Raynor and Murray case in New South Wales, came out of the district court and it got a lot of media publicity at the time. A resident was ordered to pay and. dollars in damages to a chairperson because of what were found to be defamatory emails. Mm, I remember that, Amanda. Yes. So go back and listen to 167 if you like. But here's the update. The resident appealed that decision to the New South Wales Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal has overturned it. Mm. in a judgment with fairly detailed reasons, and I will, of course, link to that in our show notes. The Court of Appeal has found that the damages award was manifestly excessive. Damages should have been no more than $25,000, nowhere near $130,000. Mm. There was no malice in the emails the court found, And the district court judge really got it wrong in assessing the damages. So that decision has been overturned and the resident has been awarded her legal costs. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. We don't get too many of these 
cases reported when it comes to defamation in strata. We don't have too many that go, <laughs> that, go that far. So an interesting one to have on our books. And when we spoke back in episode 167, Rena, we were talking about the need to be very careful when mm. you are communicating full stop, but communicating by email, communicating in writing, sometimes in the heat of the moment, forgetting that these things might be copied to other residents, which these particular emails were copied to 16 other residents, and that they will be on the books and records of the Owners Corporation. You may not necessarily be protected by defences like qualified privilege, which was discussed in this case, and you may be exposed. So the fact that this case has been overturned essentially on the basis that the damages award was far too high, doesn't mean we should be any less alert to these issues, I think. So that is the case of Murray and Rayner. That decision came out on the 13th of November from our New South Wales Court of Appeal. I'll pop the link in the show notes to this episode, which you can always access over at yourstrataproperty.com.au forward slash podcasts. Look for this episode up the top of the list. And if you're listening to this prior to the end of the year, happy holidays, everyone. Yes. <laughs> and um, try and have a good rest as well. <laughs> Indeed. See you in 2020. Okay. Bye, Amanda. <laughs> bye. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today?